All right, it's two o'clock. Welcome everybody. My name is Ling Ui and I'm uh, from the Fidelio Consortium. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ralph Muller from the Institute for Biomechanics at the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule Zürich in Switzerland. Professor Muller's presentation is entitled Multiscale Mechanobiology in Bone Adaptation and Regeneration. The awareness of the importance of mechanically driven bone adaptations is increasing. So today we will hear about the complex interactions between different cell types and how they respond. Professor Muller, the floor is yours to tell us about spatial mechanomics approaches. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn, for this uh, kind of introduction. Um, don't want to spend too much time on you know, saying much about the project that I'm going to present and also about the Fidelio uh, project. We're not going to be talking about the aims of the Fidelio. We're still working on those, of course, and you hear updates on, on that. What I try to do is to give you a, a story that has led to uh, a the ERC advanced grant that I'm working on with my team. So there's, there's a lot of people working on that. And we started that actually quite you know, some time ago. So the first steps were done maybe 10 years ago. And then that culminated in writing a grant five years ago. And then you know, four years ago, it was funded. And, and so I'm trying to show some of the data that actually led to them and where we are right now in understanding mechanobiology, bone adaptation and regeneration, and the type of work we do with that uh, team, which maybe six or seven people are actually currently working on uh, in my laboratory. So um, it's good that I don't have to give uh, much of an introduction to this audience about what bone is, of course, it's a living organ um, and um, it's uh, able to adapt its internal microarchitecture by the bone forming cell, the osteoclast, bone resorbing cells, the osteoclast, and what we believe to be these mechanosensitive cells that are embedded and tuned into the bone matrix and the mineralized matrix, the osteocytes. And um, when we look at the interplay of that, we, we call that in general remodeling. And so here is just a sketch that uh, shows you, you know, what the, the blast and class are doing in a more homeostatic case. So this would be, you know, constantly throughout life. You will be remodeling your bones so that every five, three to five years, basically your whole skeleton is replaced. And so osteoclasts, uh, that you can see here, uh, eating away uh, bone and then is formed, you know, by this uh, forming zone from the osteoblast again. And so again, this is a net zero type of application, right? So, but that never happens actually, like you typically always have some changes, of course, in the structure. And this is to adapt the bone actually to pre-defined pre, uh, uh, loading scenarios, right? So when you may be more strenuously doing exercise or uh, if you have a lot of bed rest, uh, maybe been ill uh, for some time, then uh, bone is uh, also adapting to that, to these uh, requirements. And we'll get to that a little bit more in detail later on what that means. So this bone remodeling allows basically to adapt to new load conditions, as I said, but also very importantly, the renewal of old bone material. So, you know, bone gets fractures, uh, not uh, as a microscopic fracture, microscopically injured in that sense all the time when you do uh, strenuous work um, and uh, or if you have to jump from a certain height, you might actually have some micro cracks in your bone. And that would, of course, uh, make defects in the bone and the bone is not good anymore and cannot carry uh, load as easily as uh, normally. And so that's why yeah, what you want to do is to take this out, this piece of bone and, and replace it with pristine new bone that, you know, is, is good in that sense. So this is where the really purpose of the bone remodeling to always have that new bone. So from that point of view, it's a very smart material bone, right, that can heal itself and something that we're looking for also in engineered materials, of course, but uh, there we don't have the cells uh, that are actually doing that. And we don't have these coordinators that actually can sense all of that. Right? And you can imagine that um, this is really for the osteocytes that are kind of central in these bones, that they are in a good place to feel much of that. 
So the failure of remodeling leads to diseases such as osteoporosis and associated fractures. And uh, this is, of course, also and not doesn't have to be necessarily osteoporotic fractures. It could also be um, diabetic fractures. And uh, the important thing is this would lead to macroscopic failure of the tissue in minimally traumatic uh, events that, of course, are devastating. And so this is something we would like to understand and also help maybe with uh, approaches to counteract these uh, events. So maybe a few words first before I go into the mechanical energy more. It's like, you know, how does bone fail? So this is two pieces of uh, trabecular bone and human vertebral bone. And uh, you can see on the left side here a piece of bone uh, that has been put under compression and image stepwise uh, as we put displacement on it. So you can see how the bone fails and you can see that this is a healthy uh, donor in that sense that was here and otherwise uh, the bone healthy. And uh, the uh, part here is from an osteoporotic uh, person because the failure behavior is quite dramatically different. You don't, you see clearly that there is less bone here, but also the way it fails is very different. Right here you can actually limit the failure to this region here. So this is where almost all the failure happens, whereas this region here doesn't actually fail. Whereas in the osteoporotic bone, you have failure then. And that's actually quite important. So first of all, it's quite easy to predict where the failure will happen actually in these cases. It's where you see a little bit more blue in the background. This is, means that it's slightly less dense in this area. And then the bone fails actually where is the weakest link in the chain. Whereas uh, on, on this side, uh, you can see that, of course, again, as I said, less bone is there, but you have all kinds of behavior of buckling, um, you have even tension going on in some areas like this, uh, you have the plates that are faltering, you know, and so this is really a very different uh, behavior. And that has also consequences in the adaptation and healing in that sense of the structure. Whereas in this case, you basically can focus all your efforts to remodel and heal uh, the bone in this, in this small area. Here, the cells have to work on all ends and they are quite demanding, right? So the cells do not exactly know, almost get confused, or which things should we do first, right? They need to actually work at many different locations in this structure and they need to get there from, let's say, the marrow as the stem cell pool is uh, in the marrow. So um, this is an important uh, thing actually, actually as well. But let's see a little bit what are the elements that are typically failing. And so what you can see, of course, is specifically uh, very thin rods. Um, they fail uh, preferentially, uh, but also plates in the bone structure that have holes inside. We call this fenestration effects. So this is a classical hallmark with aging. So with aging, and in osteoporotic cases, you get a thinning of the structure. That's what you see here, the very thin ones will fail. And at the same time, you get these holes, fenestrations, actually in these plates. And uh, why are these holes uh, really bad? I mean, they actually do very little bone density change, All right? So there's, there's, there's not much change in bone density overall. The mass looks pretty much the same, but the hole is very important. And why is this very important? If you look here at the higher resolution imaging model using cyclotron radiation, you can see very clearly that this hole um, forms a concave structure and the concave structures are predominantly giving rise to cracks uh, in the structure. You have another concave structure here, and this is also where you see a crack, but this little hole has actually now the origin of three cracks. And then we can measure how big the cracks are and the volume and how this is progressing over time with non-destructive imaging approaches. For all of the visualization, we're using some kind of micro CT X-ray based imaging. It can come from a desktop source um, and a laboratory equipment, or in this case from the synchrotron side. Uh, but it's all the same principles behind it, the, the basic, basic CT principles that we are using, and we can just achieve very high resolution around on a micron level um, in this case here. Um, so if we go and look actually now, even with slightly higher resolution, this was 350 nanometers measured in 3D. And you can see that you have now a visualization of a piece of bone that has all the osteocyte lacuna inside. It has the blood vessels inside. And in green, you can see shimmering through 
at these crack awake planes. And if I take away the ostracides for a moment, and you can see better actually where the, the cracks are evolving. And you see that they're actually on these surfaces again, right? So this is a cortical bone. And then the blood vessels actually uh, define concave structures in the mineralized matrix. And they give rise to the cracking uh, of the bone. So they, you know, the more blood vessels you have in there, uh, the more likely you are to actually have a crack happening. And this is another thing that we see, of course, uh, with the aging process, that you get these uh, osteons that are you know, getting super osteon, very big uh, blood vessels inside, um, or very big holes in the cortical bone. And this is dangerous because you might actually get cracks from that. So similar type of thing, you know, so this is just pure mechanics, uh, but you can still learn something also for the mechanobiology of that. So and that's what I want to show in this graph here, where you can see that uh, you know, this big blood vessel that is down here, or this void canal, as we sometimes say, because you're not always knowing it's a, it's, a, it's a blood vessel inside, is giving rise to this crack that is going in this direction. And uh, the crack you can see now, you know, it's going, of course, in 3D, as they show in the other side, but it does actually go through the osteocytic lacuna. So this is a, a quite an important uh, feature because the osteocytes are tracking, actually, the crack because they are sinks. They are also mechanically kind of weaker, of course, at that point, and the cracks actually preferentially go through these uh, osteocytes. So you can think about that. The crack is very obvious to see, but um, you know you have also other just the mechanical stresses and strains will also be attracted by these uh, things. So before you crack it. And uh, that also means that the ostracides are uh, perfect sensors because all of the mechanical forces will go right through them. They very early sense, oh gosh, there's something coming, there's a wave, there's a strain. And so they are reacting to that also biologically in physiological way. Not only when you break, of course, that's a devastating effect, but uh, also in just normal physiological loading, the ostracides will be perfectly situated to feel you know, what kind of forces are on that bone and can counteract because they have the ability to send out you know, agents to the surface, to the blast and the class to either build more bone where it's needed and uh, actually take away bone where it's not a request. And I'll get to that into more detail just in a second. And of course, when we have such effects of having people that have fractures, uh, we ask ourselves, can we stop osteoporosis or can we prevent fractures in more general for other diseases, again, like in diabetes. Um, and yes, of course, uh, we have a lot of drugs available uh, these days that will help you know, reducing such fractures of at least 50%. Um, but um, yeah, that's just 50% also on one side and people are quite, um, uh, let's say, adverse. So they, they do not want to necessarily take uh, these uh, medications. Um, the uh, elderly people feel like, yeah, they might not want to, you know, take uh, another drug actually. And, and so, is there other ways of actually helping those uh, those people? And one of the ways, of course, is to use this bone adaptation capabilities. So this is something we usually refer to as Wolf's Law. And uh, Louis Wolf was. Uh, a orthopedic surgeon and anatomist um, in, in Berlin, and, and he already recognized with the help of actually uh, an engineer from uh, ETH, uh, his name was Coleman, uh, who did a, a lot of this, uh, a lot of calculations of stresses and strains in trains, and he brought this analogy that the bone uh, is uh, adapting to the principal forces that are happening, you know, like in this femur here, and you can see that quite nicely in this structure. And what Wolfson found out by just looking at bones, he said like bone forms and gets stronger when it's loaded. And is bone or not, or only lowly loaded, it will resorb and get weaker. And so this is, uh, he was talking about the transformation of bone already, you know, a, a long time ago. And just by observing under the microscope, uh, these uh, structures here, and you can see how you have fortification of the bone in the area where you have principal stress that's coming in through the hip, and then also on, on the other side you have muscle attachment, of course, uh, like in this area here, and you have muscle attachment on this side. So you need more 
bone in this area so that you can basically react to the muscle uh, that is pulling on the bone. So this is uh, an important uh, finding and uh, we have been working on that for, for a long time and people have uh, looked at this and, and used this as a mechanism. So examples of Wolf's Law are tennis players or baseball players, uh, especially the pitchers, uh, that have typically something like 30% more bone than of the tennis player in their serving arm. So it's, it's very important. The serve is where you have the highest impact. It's not about just playing readily, so it doesn't matter whether you're playing with one arm or two arms. Serving is always done with one arm, and that's where you get about 30% more bone actually in the forearm uh, of these tennis players. The same with pictures uh, in the shoulder, I think, is where they actually get most of the uh, effects uh, because uh, when they release the ball, this is an extremely high uh, impact uh, force that is uh, hitting their humors. So, um, uh, one other example uh, of people that don't have any problems with bones are bodybuilders. They have a lot of muscle that are pulling on their bone all the time, but yeah, you look at that person, it might have other problems than the bone. So, uh, maybe not a good idea to go overboard, right? And there's also telling a little bit that what I'm talking about is an anabolic treatment to some extent. So, if you are doing something with bone with exercise and water type support and mechanics on it, it will have an anabolic response, right? You're building new bone actually, not just remarketing uh, uh, you know, in that sense. And so, another side on the downside will be astronauts, right? That we all know that they're losing bone, they lose about uh, bone at the rate of 2% uh, per month, which is, uh, you know, depending on the age uh, category you're looking at, how old you're young. Uh, so, but they, they might be something like uh, losing a month, what other people lose in a year. So quite accelerated, and that's a big issue. Uh, if you lose two percent uh, by month per month, and you want to go to the Mars, which is one way two years, and then coming back two years, um, you are not having much bone left right when you arrive on Earth. So you need to take counter actions to make sure that you can sustain uh, gravity again once you're back. And of course, this is the lack of gravity. So you always see that this is an important part. Um, so vibration therapy might actually be something that one could use. There's a lot of interest in the technology. Maybe you've been on a vibrating plate yourself and experienced and how this is shaking you up. And scientific studies show that bone is very susceptible to mechanical vibrations. Vibration therapy is currently investigated as a potential therapy against osteoporosis. And vibration is sound. So, uh, and so that question that you often have to ask yourself is, are bones therefore able to hear? Do they have a hearing? And how are they able to hear? Um, and that's very important. I will show some analogy later on, and I think it's actually quite important to keep that in mind. So we're talking about sound and the hearing of sound and reacting to that and getting an impression somehow that um, uh, you can react to or like a memory as well, uh, what the sound, the best sounds maybe are uh, for you. And uh, what do we know so far, right? The maintenance and adaptation of bone morphology results from this orchestrated uh, remodeling process with the three cell types I was talking about. There's more cells involved, but this is the majority of cells that we are looking at for the action itself. Bone, some that remove bone, some that actually form bone, and uh, the other sites that coordinate this, right? And this uh, is, uh, they do that with biochemical signals. And so you have some kind of a translation of mechanical signals to biochemical signals, and this will then result in increased or decreased bone formation or resorption activities. So to better understand bone adaptation um, and also on the shoulder to regeneration, we therefore have to understand how osteocytes sense in the process of mechanical loading within their local and microenvironment. And for this, we use mass models. Um, we also have uh, work going on in, in humans, and that's part of the PWD project. So, Matthias Wally is actually looking at mechanobiology from human uh, measurements that we do with CT. And, but here, most of what he's working on has been established actually in mouse models. And so, one mouse model we use is a mouse model of bone adaptation. It's in a classic uh, black six mouse. Typically, what I show here is that we also use. Uh, accelerated aging models of premature aging, like Golgi. Um, uh, so we can use all kinds of mice, of course, to do that. We've shown that this works in many, many strains, uh, but this is our you know, uh, preferred backbone, typically the black six. And uh, what they do is actually push pins uh, in two adjacent tail bones. Um, the, the tail is uh, quite uh, 
easy to get access to and to have these pins uh, pushed. And then what we're looking at is actually at this caudal vertebra that is between two other caudal vertebra and then we use vibration or mechanical, cyclic mechanical loading um, to, you know, press against these. And so we do that actually for three thousand cycles at 10 hertz. That means it's five minutes of therapy for relatively high loads. Eight Newton is about half of the breaking strength of that bone. So quite a bit. Uh, you would scale that up to humans, right? So um, maybe a femur breaks uh, 4,000 Newton. Um, so you need 2,000 Newton loading, that's 200 kilos. So that's quite a bit. And that's one of the problems. And how do you actually accelerate 200 kilos uh, with 10 hertz? So people are still struggling a little bit with that. It's the max that's possible because the loads are relatively small. So working against gravity is not a big issue, for example. We do that for four weeks. Okay, so five minutes, three times a week of exercise, if you want. Four weeks, what happens is this. You can see that how bone is now from this state, increasing in density. And you can see the fortification of individual trabeculae, so it's getting thicker. And if you quantify that, and that's the beauty of micro CT, we can quantify all of that. You can see you get about 20% more bone by just this very small interact, you know, three, five minutes, right? So, I mean, if you could get that in a human and femur five minutes, three times a week, um, while you're cooking or something like that, you'd be on a vibrating plate and you get 20% more bone, that would be really something. Um, so the potential is high, but unfortunately the translation to humans has not been. But what do we learn from the animal models? I just want to first show a little bit the visualization of the load adaptation process again. Um, here you can see, you know, baseline image. And it's also just amazing how you can see the resolution that we have. This is 10 microns in vivo. So this is a life mass. 10 microns. So we take one measurement. This is somewhere in a quadrant vertebra. You see some more global pictures later on. A very small piece. Uh, this is maybe something like about one, one millimeter, less than one millimeter, maybe 800 microns or something like this apart. And we can find back to this place all the time. So this is the first week after loading. And you can already see that there's actually some fortification in this area, some thickening going on. If I move, there's more thickening. The, the, the holes that I was talking about that are dangerous, of course, for fracture, um, they are start closing uh, fourth week. Um, Third week, fourth week now, you know, really much smaller holes, uh, much less uh, likely to actually have uh, fractures, uh, better protect, uh, an increase of 20%. So it's exactly what we want. And then we can use this uh, registration tools and, and also looking at formation resorption actually in these mice. So it's very, quite important. So you can see everything in orange here is surfaces that have undergone formation in those four weeks. And whenever you have formation, you will also have intrapecular bone resorption at the same time. So that not all surfaces are on an anabolic you know, growth in that sense. So you also still have compensatory effect where bone has will be removed. And why is it actually removed? And I want to show this graph here. This is another full vertebra. We kind of go a little bit in flying through it. And, and uh, what uh, you can see in color is something that we have calculated the strains and stresses here is uh, strain energy density uh, for the for the graphs and in we're using finite element analysis so a non-structive technique to get the mechanics right of the structure and that's what you see here um, if you have a, an area that is blue that is slowly loaded if you have an area that is red or yellow or this one then this is an area of high um, strains so high loading there and uh, again, remember that we said, you know, in Wolf's Law, um, whenever you have high loads, you should see bone forming, and where we have low loads, you see bone resorbing. And uh, of course, if you change that, if you have, for example, here high loads, and you will actually have high, more bone formation, then this will unload on other areas, and those will then be prone to resorption. And is that actually the case? So we can, the good thing is we can now calculate this, these uh, strain maps and at the same time we can look at remodeling maps because we have legal data, we can register the data and then we can see, you know, inside the structure, right, in uh, 
orange again, the formation in this bluish uh, violet uh, color is uh, the bone resorption and everything in gray is where you have quiescence, so nothing changed uh, over the time period that you observe. And if I now look a little bit more detail, you can see here very nicely, this is an area where bone has been overloaded, let's say, highly loaded, and that actually did result in bone formation. And when you look at the area where you had initially very low strains, this led to bone resorption. So as we have predicted. So when you look, of course, you will find places where this doesn't fit so well, so, uh, but you need to look at it quantitatively uh, eventually. And that's an important part, of course, that we don't only want to um, have visual uh, experience. So I want to show you a study that we did in looking also how important frequency is in that. So here we had done a, a number of experiments. So we had five experimental groups in these mice. So we always use about you know, six to 10 animals. So it depends a little bit on the study design. Um, this is enough per group. And what we did is this 10 hertz loading that I was talking about, we also had a group with only 5 hertz loading, 2 hertz loading, and then a constant load. So you wrap up the load to 8 newton, but then keep it constant for 5 uh, minutes, and then no loading whatsoever. So 0 newton constant load, let's put it this way. And what, what happens if you do that, right? That's the question. So we do a micro CT, time resolution, we look at the regular and cortical uh, volumes, and we calculate resorption information maps. We use the macro FD analysis to calculate the mechanical milieu and the micro environment that is uh, very important, of course, for what the cells feel in their local environment. And if you look now at the static um, or unloaded sham animals, you can see that the bone volume fraction actually decreased uh, over time slightly. So this is also known, this is something we would have expected that if you put a static load on it um, or a zero newton load, so uh, don't allow actually for physiological loading in that, sense, in that time, uh, then, then you have some bone resorption. And still over time, because they are growing and older, there is a little bit of trabecular thickening going on. This is just the background that you have these sham or um, control static uh, and and then you can see then, of course, how this is happening. You can see this is a thinning process and some of the structures are disappearing uh, over time in that four-week period. So this leads to a negative remodeling. So you can see uh, quite a bit more blue than orange in that sense, or this violet color. And this is uh, you know, about um, half a percent per day you can calculate the, the bone that you so now if you look at cyclic loading at the 10 hertz, um, you can see that uh, if I start this, you have this, what I already showed before, this uh, thickening going on, right? So this structure gets thicker. Um, you also sometimes it appears and something disappears. Uh, this is maybe just moving out of the plane that we're looking at. But overall, you see the quick clearly this thickening, and you can see that the thickening process has been heavily uh, induced. This leads to bone volume fraction at a higher end. If you look at it very carefully, you can also see that this is dose uh, dependent. So that 10 hertz uh, is the highest uh, bone volume fraction, and in 5 hertz is almost the same as that. And then at uh, you know 2 hertz, you still have an effect, um, and then compared to you know nothing at all or a constant load. And so this leads then to positive remodeling, you know, more orange than the violet, and this is what you see, the bone formation rate minus the bone resorption rate is positive, right? And it's very clearly that the 10 hertz has the highest uh, number. So this was just published uh, last year, actually, as something uh, that, uh, a nice finding. But what is really important in that is this uh, graph here, when you then plot the changes in VBTV over frequency, you can see that you have, must have said, the highest in 10 hertz, a little less than 5, um, still less than two, and then being negative for static uh, load. But this actually fits quite nicely with logarithmic law and uh, with reasonable correlation. And this is very important because now going back to hearing, right, you probably all know about decibels, and that's what you express your hearing capacity, right? So, and that's a, that's actually a logarithmic law, right? So, you, you, if you take the same law as uh, with sound pressure, 
this is how you perceive sound, you can see that the bone does exactly the same thing. So it reacts to it in a logarithmic fashion. So if you logarithmize all of the frequencies, then you get a linear relationship between the logarithmized frequency and the change in dvtv. So which is really important, right? So you, so this also means that it's important to know these frequencies. They probably species dependent. So for humans, this will look different because of their mass overall. And but um, for this species, you can then plug in this curve, and, and then you know that oh, if you were going to 20 hertz, that would actually be very helpful. Put a lot of energy, but it will actually not react with that. So that's an important finding. So we have certain thresholds that you need, and that's uh, so there is no such thing, uh, right? Because normally you don't lose bone, and these animals gain bone over time and they get older. Uh, but uh, if you can keep still and not move uh, at all, you need you know be you know 0 0.36 hertz. That's really not a lot of you know frequency anymore. It's quite still. If you go below that, then you actually start to be a catabolic effect. And this is something that explains quite well what happens in, in space because the people do not have any impact forces. Uh, they can move their muscles, but they cannot move that very fast. And so they have very low uh, frequencies that the body is exposed to. And that's why they actually in this catabolic range that they don't get enough uh, vibration uh, when they are in space. And, uh, Again, no catabolic meaning, anabolic meaning, that's just said all. Okay, um, now we do that link again, you can see the remodeling map, SED, but also important now is gradients in SE, so the strain energy density are probably even more important. And if you're focusing on these small areas, you see the same patterns again, right? As I said, what I said before, formation uh, is uh, linked to high uh, strain energy density gradients and not just at absolute numbers and the other way around with the resolution. And you can plot this as probability plots, and you can see that this is formation plot. So if you have very low SED values or gradients of SED values, then you're unlikely, you know, your, your probability to have a, a formation event is down to about 0.25. Whereas uh, if you have very high SED values, you, you, you're twice as high and likely to actually remodel. So this in positive or that you have formation. And it's just the opposite, of course, for this uh, resolution curve. And you can see that if you take this gradient measure rather than the absolute uh, SED values, then you have a, a slightly better or, uh, differentiation. So you can explain more of the events. So, so it's more important what the difference is between different areas of strain than the actual real strain that is on, right? So, you know, can, it depends, uh, um, how should I put this, uh, maybe a good example is if you're walking uh, up a mountain and this will take two kilometers to maybe do, I don't know, one uh, 100 meters up, uh, that's not very strenuous, but if you only have 100 uh, meters to walk 100 meters up, uh, that's, that's difficult, you can't do that, right? So this gradient that you have, it's actually some of the efforts, right? It's much more strenuous actually this way, and that the cells feel that uh, that uh, these gradients are high and they have to be more active. Um, okay, so another thing I want to talk about is the mouse model of the bone regeneration, um, which is very similar in, in that sense. We also use e external equipment, so now we use an external fixture to do an osteotomy in the femur. So no longer in the tail, we also have a tail model for regeneration, but we typically will use the steamer model. And we can look at different uh, healing phases using the micro CT. We can look at physiological versus impaired healing patterns, but also the effect of mechanical loading. And uh, that's what we do. So this, uh, we can instrument actually these fixators here to have them such that you can load them, as we were just uh, seeing before. Um, so when you, when you do that, you know, this is actually vibrating. So, right, so this is also then pushing against each other with 10 hertz and uh, with some load on it, so similar range that we had before. And we also just observe what actually happens. So this is a nice animation that just has been created by uh, Nishin Medavan uh, in our lab. And you can see how control and loaded animals over the period of six weeks are adapting and regenerating, right? So just trying to run that again. 
So you can see that you know they all uh, heal, but you can see how the extension of the callus is happening. And now after three weeks, you start the loading. Before they were actually similar, and now this is the expansion of the cortex, and the callus gets much bigger. So you I don't have the number top of my head. I think it's also something like probably 30% more bone mass uh, at the end of the time. But this is a very important part that if you have uh, loading in your controlled loading, in your, so they don't break it again, of course, it's very important. And we do that by using a real-time final element analysis to predict whether the bone will be overloaded. So we only use, uh, you know, forces that will not overload the bone, but give mechanobiological signals so that the bone can actually adapt. And that's something that is quite successful. I just want to show here is not as beautifully colored, uh, let's say, right? You can see though that there's higher strains in this area to the low strains in this area. And then we also had in the remodeling uh, component, when the callus gets remodeled, you see that bone was formed in this area and bone is absorbed. So the same kind of principles hold true also for regeneration and uh, the remodeling or the adaptation of the bone after regeneration, because you always have to remodel the callus, and that should be done on the low. So last bit uh, of my presentation, I want to take this a little bit more in the molecular domain and how we can use imaging to uh, target uh, you know, spatial mechanomics in all societies. And this is an approach we call local in vivo environment light imaging. And what is this? I talked much about it, just want to quickly summarize again. So we do an in vivo micro CT image. Then we take a second picture, um, let's say a week later. We are registering these, and so we can calculate the bone remodeling map and we can do the strain energy density maps. Then at the end of the study, we can of course take histological sections. So we take two-dimensional histological sections or many, many histological sections to recreate a three-dimensional volume. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, when you look in a very detailed view, you will see that in this small little fraction, you see all of these ostracides inside. Right? So this is the nuclei, these are the dendrites of the ostracides. And then we use uh, laser caption microdissection. I have been using, there's some new ways we want to do that, but uh, what we've done in the past is using laser caption microdissection and cut out each individual cell on the whole section, right, or many places in the section. And now what we can do, uh, I wanted to show that how this works. So this is the laser that is kind of cutting through the histological section in a an undecalcified bone section. It has to do it in this version three times. And then it uses a laser pulse and will you know, basically shoot out this in an end of tube. And then you have this RNA that is in there ready to do something else with it. Okay, so this is just to show that we're doing these kind of processes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite labor intensive, of course, and uh, you can only have about half an hour time until you have totally degraded RNA. So you have to be fast with that. But if you have it, you, you now have all of these individual cells, or we sometimes put them in groups of cells, and we'll talk about that uh, later, uh, because it's difficult to do RNA, let's say, sequencing on single cells still in such tissue preparation um, cell content. But you can associate bone remodeling with each one of these cells. So you know, okay, this is a quiescent area, this is a formation area, this is a resorption area. You can also say, oh, this is, you know, relatively highly loaded, very highly loaded, um, more like unloaded areas. So you, you can always find out about the mechanical and the formation resorption remodeling environment for each cell. So you have some markers there, spatial markers, right, that you uh, can say, well, what does actually, what kind of genes are then expressed because you can do biochemical analysis and you do come qPCR or an RNA sequencing with these attractions. And uh, one study that I would like to show uh, here is a you know, preliminary study done quite some time ago, um, where we look at three genes, SOS, OPG, and red ligand. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see SOS would be something that you can get down that way with uh, high loading, but uh, you know, when you exercise, SOS would be you know, non-regulated, so SOS codes for sclerostin. And uh, you can see that this is somehow the case uh, for this animal, but it's not significant. OBG, but 
seem to be anything happening. But what's really interesting is the marine gliding then seems to be quite under control of mechanical uh, loading. Uh, whereas you have in areas where you have very low loading, no rank gliding available. In areas of medium loading, you see you know, highly reduced, uh, you know, and, and 10 times lower than in areas of, of um, um, sorry, low loading, so maybe the same way around. So low loading, right? And you only have rank lighting detected when you have very low loading, means that this should be resorbed and rank lighting obviously is secreted to the surface so that the osteoclast can be formed and actually resorb this portion of the bone. So this is highly on the mechanical control, much more on the on the resorption side than maybe on what we think it will be the formation side. Um, when you load the animal on top, you can see that soft is downregulated overall. So this is lower because that's what you would think. It's like an exercise to put it on, but uh, it's not uh, regulated by local mechanics um, so much. OPG maybe starts doing that, and our rank ligand is even further reduced, right? 10 times reduction everywhere, um, not detectable anymore for medium and, and, uh, and high. Uh, loads. So this is something you eliminate more or less rank like the system, which means an osteoclastic signaling and recruitment of osteoclasts will be very difficult. So you're stopping basically this auction, right? And you do this loading. So that's something that a good finding that we have. Uh, we can then do that for you know many uh, genes. Uh, right now not for you know, full sequences, but you know this is uh, some 13 genes or uh, that we have now studied in uh, 74 subpopulations, and we do clustering of these uh, genes and look at what, how they associate this cluster with high and low loading and formation resolution. And I just want to show how these clusters actually behave. You can see in A cluster, you have uh, mostly associated with low LCD, um, and only a few of these uh, genes here uh, are associated with high LCD in spatial context. With B uh, cluster, it's even more like that. So, you know, again, resorption in both of these clusters seems to be much tighter controlled by mechanics than actually formation. So, there is some cluster of genes that are more, more associated with high SD values, so being responsible for some formation. And we can look at that also when we look at the remodeling clusters. And you can see that in the A cluster, you only had resorption uh, events, right? And, and so I said, uh, and quiescence, there is no formation happening with those genes and the regulation of it. Um, and uh, in the B cluster, you have a little bit of mix. You have some uh, formation, um, you have mostly quiescence. So the same result for SCD values, but a very different behavior in the, the probability within the cluster for remodeling. And then you can see that uh, you will start reducing the C cluster it's actually almost nothing to do with resorption, mostly with formation and keeping quiescence in the hustle. Remember that quiescence, so bone not changing, is a very important state because the osteocyte love that the best, right? So if nothing changes for them, their chances of surviving are the highest. So they do not want to have new bone form, certainly do not want to have bone resorbed because they got eaten up in the process. So that's something they really control much better than resorption because they are they need to protect themselves and uh, they can actually sit on that. All right. So um, if if you look at some of the genes, I actually don't want to go into that details. You find a number of genes that then are upregulated, downregulated, that are wind signaling, growth factors that are included, that are associated with high loading, low loading. Uh, the formation, of course, the same. You can see that osteolysis and, and again, wind-related um, genes and then proteins that are coded for that are going to be involved in that. I don't want to go in that. We don't have time to be able to look at that. But the final thing I want to quickly look at, we can also use immunized chemistry and using these optical images, rather than do cutting out of cells, you can stain the cells, right? But you can you know, lost histological probes. And uh, for here, we have stained prosclerostin in this brownish color. And uh, you can see that the zero Newton uh, bone has a lot more brown than the eight Newton. So you're down regulating this mechanism. And then you can look at how this uh, is actually happening 
when we look at areas of resorption, areas of quiescence, and area of formation. And you can see that the sclerosing expression is lower in these formation areas, as you would have expected, but it's not a huge difference. That's very important to actually say that. But if you look at how formation is regulated, you can see when you look at the mineral acquisition rate from, from high formation to low or high resorption, uh, you can see that this is extremely tightly controlled expression of sclerostin positive losses side. So, you know, this is the two animals and both of them are, you know, this one is 0.96, so 96% determined that of the, the positive losses side, the um, sclerostin positive losses side fraction, just by looking at what the mineral acquisition rate is. So that's quite an interesting, very tight control of um, protein expression in, in these samples. Uh, this is a, 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 a behavior here that is important to look at the 3D context. So if I showed you this graph, we have now identified in this piece of bone and registered with micro CT at these uh, cells, so right? we can do that. And we can see sclerosis negative and sclerosis positive cells. And uh, I have the formation plot in these two dimensional sections and I have the SED plot in this two dimensional section, but it's very difficult to associate. Right? You can see here is a little bit of uh, resorption, here is a little bit of uh, formation, but well, you know, you're not so sure what's going on in the foreground and background. So if you use actually three-dimensional context, right, then you can see that in 2D you haven't even seen that. These are sourcing sort of negative and they should be associated actually with the formation of bone. Right? And that's what's happening. You can't see that in 2D. You need the three-dimensional context to see that formation is happening just in fact with these cells. Um, the same it would be true if I would look at a different view that these cells here associated with resorption that is further in, in the front here. You can't see it uh, in this picture. But the same is true for SED, um, but even more so for the SED gradient, but this is a gradient over time. So here it says like if SED is increasing over time, let's say from four, two weeks to four weeks, or decreasing. This seems to be an important signal. You can see that uh, the cells that are associated with the increase, they are more likely to be sclerosing negative, and the cells that are associated with decrease over time in SCD are associated with a um, sclerosing positive imprint. And then we can also show that this is statistically significantly different from each other. Okay, with this, I would like to conclude uh, that we have this spatial economics approach. We can bring in all the colors you want, looking at formation, resorption, mechanical strains, bringing all the cells uh, that you can individually visualize here. And uh, with that, uh, we uh, learn how we can associate, hopefully, uh, gene expression, protein expression with the mechanical and with the formation modeling environment. Um, so this uh, is a time-lapse imaging allows us to do that. And the court, the light imaging allowed clarification of the role of the wide range of genes as key players in the mechanically induced bone adaptation process. Spatial mechanomics allows coupling of biochemical information with the mechanical and remodeling microenvironment of osteocytes and other cells. And uh, this is um, this uh, spatial mechanomics informs also cell-based in silico models. This is an example of work of uh, Boretti in the lab, uh, where you can see some cells uh, walking around. He simulates actually this process over time, and uh, you would have uh, Osteocytes in the model, osteoblast, osteoclast, and in the agent based model that uh, allows you to look at uh, time lapse uh, biology actually and then fit that with whatever we find in the individual measurements. And uh, finally, uh, this will hopefully in the future facility better understanding of biochemical signal pathways in bone adaptation and regeneration uh, in the this, I'd like to thank uh, the people that have been involved most in that work. They're not fully up to date. Unfortunately, we're still missing that picture of the group uh, uh, after Corona. But most of the people um, that are in here have contributed directly uh, to early work, uh, of course. And now there's two people that are missing here. And there's funding agencies that are also very important to actually fund all of that work. And thank you for your attention.